Hello and welcome back to the Virginia History Podcast. To this point in the podcast, I've been laying down a foundation upon which the English would build their Virginia settlement. The English were ready to colonize the New World in the 1580s. At least they were ready in spirit, if not in reality. Privateering exploits by John Hawkins and, more famously, Sir Francis Drake, had greatly captivated the English mind and revealed to the world that the Iberian monopoly was just an illusion. Riches were there for the taking, literally in the case of Hawkins and Drake, and figuratively for anyone else willing to put up the capital needed for undertaking an overseas adventure. Sure, there were many failures, but those failures did not dissuade future exploration attempts. In fact, they only helped to further those future attempts, and the greatest of these colonization failures still captivates imaginations 430 years later. Walter Raleigh's early life is as mysterious as the colony he'd later sponsor. He was born, perhaps between 1552 and 1554, in maybe Hayes Barton. His mother, Catherine Champernown, had also given birth to Humphrey Gilbert from a previous marriage, thus the connection between the two ill-fated colonizers. Though only half-brothers, Walter seemed to have greatly admired Humphrey. Raleigh was at least certainly influenced by Gilbert. Much of his admiration and influence was due to their family having to endure persecution at the hands of the Catholic Queen Mary, who unleashed a bloody purge against the Protestants during her reign. The Raleigh family was touched by these purges, especially when Walter's father, also named Walter, was hunted after and only escaped certain death by hiding in a tower. The Catholic impression left upon the younger Raleigh would influence the rest of his life. After Elizabeth ascended to the throne in 1558, the much more congenial as well as Protestant-leaning new queen halted the anti-Protestant purges, which certainly bolstered Raleigh's anti-Catholicism in favor of the less antagonistic Protestants, or so he thought. Raleigh's youthful Catholic hatred matured, and in 1569 he journeyed to France with a cousin in order to assist the French Calvinist Huguenots against the strong Catholic faction headed in no small part by Catherine de Medici. Details of Raleigh's time in France are somewhat hazy, however, as he seems to have been a law student at Oriel College, Oxford, as well as Inns of Court before he registered at the Middle Temple in 1575. But Raleigh claims to have been at the Battle of Jarnac, and others have surmised that he was around for the hideous St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in 1572, yet no one can know with any certainty one way or another. After what seems to have been his legal training was completed sometime in 1575, though Raleigh would later state that he had never studied the law, Raleigh sought to make his name known at court. Wisely, Raleigh figured out who the power players were and befriended them, which greatly aided his quest to the top. That journey had a series of bumpy adventures, however, which included frequent duels before taking the captaincy of a foot soldier company stationed in Munster, Ireland. Raleigh therefore followed his half-brother Gilbert's footsteps and went to Ireland. During Raleigh's tenure, he helped crush the Desmond Rebellion as well as brutally destroy a band of Spanish and Italian adventurers at Smerwick in 1580. The resulting victories were so complete that Raleigh's foot soldiers were disbanded in early 1581, and Raleigh returned to courtly escapades. This time, when Raleigh returned to court, he was already somewhat notable, largely because of his pro-Protestant work in Ireland. Most of the stories from this stint at court included his laying out a mantle in order for Elizabeth to cross over a puddle, or his writing poetry for the Queen, are largely exaggerated. But he did certainly earn her notice, which can be proven by her constant bestowing royal gifts upon Raleigh. He would receive land, titles, trade deals, and an annual pension. He was also knighted in 1584 and given control of the royal tin mines, and by 1585 he was at the height of his influence with Elizabeth. It was during this golden period of Raleigh's rise that Humphrey Gilbert, by contrast, lost all that he had, and some of what he didn't have, that Raleigh became a somewhat shadow-casting figure in American history. He was granted the renewal of Gilbert's royal patents for New World colonization in 1584. But did Raleigh really care to settle in the New World? Or would a further gift from the Queen, notably 40,000 acres of land in Ireland, take too much of Raleigh's attention? Either way, plans were set into motion, and in 1584... Philip Amadas and Arthur Barlow embarked on a scouting mission that saw them reach the Albemarle and Pamlico Sounds in present-day North Carolina. They would claim the land for England and name it in honor of the Queen. Thus Virginia received her name, and England's fledgling romance, though perilous at times, began its infancy. Over the course of the next six years, Walter Raleigh would sponsor two colonization attempts, both of which resulted in failure. 
more attention will be paid to those particular colonization attempts in forthcoming episodes. Thank you again for tuning in to the Virginia History Podcast. If you've yet to check out the website, please do so at vahistorypodcast.com, as well as subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast listening platform. And tune in next time for when I begin illustrating the first settlement attempt at Roanoke Island. Do do bad, do 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 do